I've been talking about our city for the last four weeks. But I defined our city. Our city is not just a community city out there. Our city could be, well, a relationship between husband and wife at home, where a wall has been erected and established, and they could not talk to each other. I'm talking about relationship between fathers and children, parents and children, or brothers and sisters, or even friends within the church. The walls have got up a lot. And we know that the only way you can get these walls down would be to march around those walls, praising God, thanking Him, and shouting, shouting for the walls to come down at the right time and for everything else to be disposed of that there may come reconciliation, that there may come love established in our lives. Today is the last part of that series about our city. It's entitled, Bless Our City. Let us bless our city. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 11, it says, By the blessing of the upright, you are the upright. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. But it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. Many of you would know Ed Silvosa. He came into prominence a few years ago about prayer evangelism and so on. He was struck with a serious illness. He was diagnosed to die within months. But he survived it. Miraculously, he was healed, obviously, by prayer. God intervened. And he wrote a book that no man should perish. That's, of course, a biblical verse and so on. That no man should perish. And in his testimony, he quoted this verse, Proverbs 11, 11. There was a dark cloud of corruption and immorality in a city in Argentina. This Ed Silboso is Argentinian, okay? And it was so frustrating and discouraging for the people. Ed met with some people, some religious, some spiritual leaders and so on in the city, and they prayed for God's guidance for action. And they were brought to this verse. And this is the way they chose to apply. Well, by the blessing of the upright, the city is consulted. So it's a power of blessing with their lips. Blessing was not just about the things that people do. Upright or redeemed or restored or believers. What they do with or under God. But they include the things that they say in the way that they talk. That applies to us. It's the way they talk about the city and people that are ruler of the city and what they say to those people, the people around them. They decided that it's a verbal exercise because the verse is written in the traditional parallelism in Hebrew poetry. It says this, by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. We want to speak about God's blessing over you. The officials, well, were firstly surprised when they went to the city hall, they went to the government office, and they said, we want to speak blessing, we want to pray for you. They thought that, well, they've come to point a finger about us and ask questions like, when will the corruption stop? When will the people's welfare be taken care of? When will you do things that are good and so on? But they never asked those questions. Ed Silvoso and his friends, they went there and they say, would you allow us to pray for you? And say, yeah. And they prayed. They blessed the city. They blessed officials. They did not point the finger of condemnation to them. What are you doing? Why are you doing these things? They did not. They just prayed for the city. And there was a change in attitudes in the city. There was a removal of corrupt officials without pointing finger and being brought to justice or whatever. Suddenly, they were gone. And there was a change in the attitude 
in that, in that city and in the whole country of Argentina, there was a revival of the love of Jesus. Now it says, by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. When we talk about exalted, well, it doesn't talk about really making the city more famous or prosperous and so on. Exalted has to do with lifting up, making the city more approach to God, not tear down the city. You see, many of you are familiar with the, a TV documentary, The Struggle Street. Yeah, okay. Well, the residents of Mount Druid were fuming with anger, wanting to sue SBS, was it ABC? or ABC, whichever, I don't know. Okay. They wanted to sue them because they were being maligned. That the documentary were focusing on the bad things about Mount Druid. Although there are bad things in Mount Druid, we know that. But it's not the approach that we should take. You may be aware that Minchin Berry, our postcode is 2770, which is a postcode of Mount Druid. Our postal office is in Mount Druid. <laughs> so if you were from somewhere else, you say, I'm writing to somebody, <laughs> the church in Mount Druid. And we could receive the same kind of, well, kind of bad publicity about it. What needed to happen was we need to acknowledge that that is a very disadvantaged area, Mount Druid. But we need to bless the city. We need to bless Mount Druid so it can be uplifted. That people will not feel bad about living there because we have even people here living there and on through it. And we are not maligning them. We not say, hey, you live in a bad area. No, we don't. It's an area that can be a lot better. How? By the blessing of the upright. When you and I begin to bless Mount Druid, when you and I begin to bless places there like Wayland or Lesbis, whatever places in Mount Druid, we bless them, and we can see changes in them. What many believers don't understand or don't pay attention is to the awesome power of their tongue. In the same book, Proverbs, it is mentioned the power of life and death is in the tongue. Imagine you can speak some people to death, the power of life and death. When we speak Life, life flows. When you speak good, the goodness of God flows to that. When you bless Mount Druid, when you bless Minchinberry, then the life of God flows in there. When we speak anything that has to do with that, like criticism, judgmentalism, unkindness, hatred, anger, it has a corrupting effect. It corrupts things, and it has a deep moral corrupting effect with us, you and me, we who know the Lord. You don't have to be trained, really, to be a master with a master degree in theology, to realize that there's power in the spoken words, and it applies to believers and unbelievers. But the power of life becomes greatly multiplied. Let me say that. The power of life becomes multiplied when the life of the living God is in you through Jesus Christ. Every one of us, we can speak life and that will be multiplied. That will be multiplied. It's not just one person. One can defeat a thousand and two, ten thousand. Remember those things. What is the application for us, basic application of this? There are two. One is a personal one. One is a citywide possibilities. When we talk about personal application, it means that the way that you will change your surrounding is by you being changed first. We know that. We knew that for a long time. We talk about husband and wife having problems. 
And the wife would say, I want him to change. And we say this, you need to change first. If you want your surrounding to change, we need to change first. If that is the case, if I want to see the surrounding change, I need to change faster. And that is a challenge for us, that we change. Then there could be city-wide possibilities. I talked about Samaria last week, but I also talk about some other places like Iconium, like Antioch, and so on. Those other, Joppa, or those other cities that were shaken by God, stirred up by God, that there was great joy that came upon them. So this morning, I invite you to join me in something that will be our assignment for the rest of the year. Last Sunday, I gave ourselves an assignment. For seven days, I said, find some people, even total stranger, and tell them, God bless you, God loves you, and so on. I know we tried. I tried. I was able to do it three times over seven. Well, we need to continue on. If I can do three in one week, maybe two next week, maybe four, it will mean that there will be people who will be blessed and love of God will be received by them, okay, without us doing so much or spending so much. How about our previous assignment? We continue. We continue about gossiping Jesus, the gospel. We need to continue talking about Jesus to people. The call to bless, the call to bless are, are twofold. One is this is the inborn capacity. We have a capacity in us. And then it is our priestly assignment. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and it's found somewhere else, it says, And he has made us kings, he, Jesus, has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I've spoken about this for many times already, that we are kings and priests. What are kings? Kings are leaders. Wherever you are, whatever you do at work or at play or in the shop, you never know somebody's looking at you, especially at work. If you declare yourself to be a Christian, they say, so this is a Christian. Some people say, let me see what he does. Oh, he cheats with his time card. Mm, that's Christian, right? He takes home paper clips. Not his own. Mm, he takes home ball pens from work. Not his own. So it's okay to steal, okay? You see, whatever we do, someone, some people are watching. So we better do the right thing. We better do. It's only paper clip. Or what? By your own. You understand? We are leaders. We are kings. But we are also priests. Priests are people who communicate God's blessings to others. When we say God bless you, God loves you, we are committing God's concern to other people. That is the job of a priest. Everyone who named the name of Jesus made a priest in Christ. We know that. <coughs> this is woven right through the fabric of the New Testament scripture. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, it says, If you are Christ, meaning if Christ is your Savior, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So when you study the whole chapter 3 of Galatians, you'll find that, that it calls you back to look at the blessing that's spoken on Abraham by the Lord in Genesis 22. When God pronounced four, four blessings upon Abraham, the fourth one, the fourth one, is this, in verse 18. In your seed, 
all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my word. We understand that Abraham has a natural seed. That's the country of Israel. Okay. But he has a spiritual seed. For you and I, we are Gentiles. And when we came to Jesus as our Savior, we became the seed of the children of Abraham. The most obvious way that that was fulfilled was through the natural seed in the nation of Israel to which Jesus was born. So the natural seed, that was fulfilled, the blessing for the whole world. However, that's not the end of it because having received Jesus as Savior, you and I have become Abraham's seed. Not a biological seed, but a spiritual seed put in you, put in me. As biological seed, okay, it is transmitted sexually, meaning Abraham, his wife, children. Children, children, that's sexual, and they come, came about natural seed. The children of Abraham, biological. But you and I, we are a spiritual seed of Abraham. How does that happen? By the transmission of speech in faith. Through grace, by faith in Christ, I become a believer in Christ. And because of that, I became a spiritual seed of Abraham. All of you, if you have received Jesus as Savior, you've been born again into God's kingdom, then you are the spiritual seed of Abraham. And whatever God has promised Abraham, whatever God has given to Abraham, that was given to you and promised to you as well. To understand how to bless, how do we bless really? The Lord has given us a pattern in Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 to 26. It's called the Aaronic blessing, the blessing by Aaron, the high priest. And we are all priests, so we can use this blessing. It says in number 6, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That's the blessing. That's the, bless, the, basis, the basis of our blessing. What does that blessing mean? Number one, it talks about protection. The Lord bless you and keep you. You're telling somebody, says, the Lord bless you, meaning God protect you. That's a blessing. Secondly, there's a brightness and radiance that drives away condemnation. The Lord make his face shine upon you. When you pronounce that to somebody, you're saying that the radiance of God, his brightness will drive away condemnation and guilt and so on. Then and be gracious to you. Grace, you know about the grace? Grace is a generosity of God's abounding mercies. By grace, but through grace, by faith in Christ, that's where we are saved. He says, be gracious. When he say, the Lord bless you and be gracious unto you, you're pronouncing the kindness of God upon that person. A disposition of favor. The, his eyes are upon you and not distracted. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. The Lord looks at you and he looks at you with what? With favor. He loves you already, but now he's looking at Jesus. What does my son, what does my daughter need? I will give it to you. Whether it's job, finances, whatever, deliverance. He says, my favor is upon you. Then he says, and give you peace. Peace means, about, it talks about security and the assurance that your future is bright. Peace. That's the call of a priest of God to bless. That is your call. That is my call. I want to encourage you to look for opportunities 
to bless someone, some people every day, every day. Several times a day, in fact. Say to someone, God bless you, God loves you. I, I had a, an Irish uh, uh, workmate before, name was Jean Carolan. And she, she told me about this Irish blessing. May you be in heaven half an hour before the devil learns you are dead. It's a blessing. He says, may you die and go to heaven before the devil knows about it. So he cannot do anything about it anymore. We are to be reminded of the things that are within the power of your tongue and my tongue. Our call in God as priest. There's a call of God. When one, to accept the privileged role. It's a privileged role. To acknowledge a loving role. To advance a believing role. To act in a uniting role. This is a privileged role. Why are we privileged? Because we are priests under God. And we have that privilege, we have the authority to bless people. Why? Because God gave us that authority and we have that privilege. A loving role. What is a loving role? Why? What kind of role is that? In Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus was speaking to a young man. He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And with all your soul and with all your mind, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We've been commanded by God to love one another. It's not a choice. It's not a choice. We are called by God. If you are mine, love one another. A new commandment I give unto you. So that people will know in the world that you are my disciples. Love one another. Who would like to be blessed anyway? Raise your hand if you want to be blessed. Okay? Keep your hands up. Good. Now, I want you to touch somebody beside you and you bless them. Come on. Bless them. Well, it's easy because you're blessing people you know. But let them out there. I want you to bless people you don't know. Now let's go to your neighbors. Next door to your house. Next door to your unit. And to the next door. And to the next door. Until you reach the local government and the state parliament and the federal parliament. That's our call. Our call is to bless our city. You start with at home, you start in the church, and then go out there and bless your neighbors. I'm not thinking of, I'm talking about taking over government. You know me enough, okay? I have no quarrel with people, with Christians who want to enter politics. I have no quarrel with them. But that is not the solution to our problem. It's not a solution. It's not a solution to have Christians in government. That is not the solution. In the early church, the first 100, 200 years, Christians were being hunted. They were being put to the lions, burned to death. Did they have a say in government? No. Do they have a lobby to lobby the politicians? No. Did they have a right to vote? No. Are they able to assemble freely? No. They were being hunted. But the Christians survived and thrived and flourished. How? By prayer. Prayer alone. That is where the power is. When you partner with God, and you stand with God, and God says, come with me. I'll take you. We'll tilt the balance. It's not a matter of whether you have a prime minister who is a devoted Christian 
and all this cabinet of the boys. I don't know whether you'll get that. Even if you get that, they will still be driven by politics, by the desire and the lobby, by opinion polls and so on, and they will make decisions for their own survival. But you and I, we have the distinct privilege of going to the throne of the highest court in the whole universe and pleading for our need, pleading for our need. The answer has to be the power of God, the way that he flows. And his kingdom is not of this world. So he flows through his church. The power of God flows through his church when it does what he wants it to do. When we come together to pray. I'd like to just plug it in quickly. Wednesday prayer meeting. I want to see more. Not because I want to see more. Because we need more. The loving role involves blessing your city, but it starts with blessing your neighbor. The believing role is from Joshua chapter 1, verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. That you believe is what God is doing. I'm calling you, therefore, to join a uniting role that we can become one, united, okay, to prayer walk your neighborhood for five months by speaking blessing. We may not be able to pray or walk like me, I won't be. But I can pray or drive. I can drive around every day, pray for the neighbors, pray for the block, pray for everything that I pass by. We can do that, but you pray. You pray for them. What has it to do with our church? I want you not to do this if you think it's crazy. If you think I've lost my marbles, don't do it. If you think it's superstitious, don't do it. If you think it's just something magical about it, don't do it. But if you believe that there is life in you through Jesus Christ, that has the capacity, the power to overcome the death force that is in the community, then walk around, drive around, and pray for your community, for the neighborhood. Remember Abraham? You are Abraham's seed. And that's where the blessing comes from. Abraham was 99. And he was complaining to God. God, when I was 75, you promised that I will be the father of many nations. I don't even have a son now. You told me to get rid of Ishmael. And God took Abraham out of the tent to look at the sky. You see the stars? Can you count them? No. Do you believe? that your descendants will be as many as the stars up there. Abraham did not love you. <laughs> you were joking. I'm 99. My wife is 89. He did not. This is what he did. He said, I believe. And because of that, the Bible says, unto you I've imputed your righteousness. You're righteous before God, before me. I said, because you believe. We need to step out of our tents. And even when we think this is laughable, even when you think that it's not possible, not plausible, not viable, it will not work. I want you to step out in the dark. Look up. I want you to do it in your heart. Just, I believe, Lord. I believe. We need to believe. Otherwise, we have nothing. You might think you cannot make any difference spiritually, but this morning the Lord is telling you two things. There's a power that he can bring in you, a miracle capacity beyond yourself to multiply life through you. 
believe that when you speak, life will be multiplied. The power of death in the tongue has often brought down relationships. Husband and wife, parents, children, friends, all other relatives and so on. And some of you have death spoken to you. You cannot do anything. You're a loser. You cannot amount to anything. You're finished. You're nothing. Some people here may have received that kind of a curse in their lives. And your life expectancy, you think, is not in years, but in the expectation of what you might be in life because of things that people have said. But there's not any force of death in this world or universe that the blessing of life cannot overthrow. There's a blessing of life from God that will overthrow and reverse anything said of you. The Lord is calling us to be His words, His lips, His life, His body, His feet. He wants us to be His and invite you to a long-term commitment. Between now and end of the year, let's bless our city. Let's bless people around us. You might do it once a week, two times a week or three times, at least you are doing it. Don't give up, don't stop, because there is power in the words of blessing that you will. Sometimes this is what we think of. We're thinking of, well, can I, we invite an eloquent speaker? Oh, a charismatic anointed speaker. Come to church, you speak the word. And the word is so powerful that people come rushing to the front. We lay hands on them and they fall all over the We want to watch that. We like watching things like that. But let me tell you something. What I just described has nothing compared. Nothing compared to when you go out there and bless others. When you pray or walk, when you drive and pray, and the spread of the power of life from your mouth is going to do more than people lying there on the floor. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. There's a power out there. And you will see things change. Society change. Government move. that there come therefore a conviction in every heart this morning that there is life power that is present in each one of us through Jesus Christ that can penetrate the veil of darkness and pull down strongholds and overthrow the forces of evil. It is a power to bless and speak life to a dying world out there. Beginning with our neighborhood, sweeping through the towns and the cities. And I want to end with this word in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Let's love and bless our city. Let's do this for the end, until the end of the year. Let's see how things will change around us. And as we approach the Lord's table, it says, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. That is encapsulated in the elements we're about to receive. It's the love of God expressed to you and to me. Let's all stand. Father God, 
we are so well. But what your son did on the cross, he died, Lord, that we may have wholeness, that we may enjoy salvation offered to us. In the bread that we have received in our hand right now, it represents the body of Christ, broken already, so that we don't have to be broken ourselves. We thank you for the cup in our hand as well. But it represents the blood of Jesus shed upon that cross in Calvary. That because of that shedding of blood, there is remission of sin. And there is availability of grace, forgiveness following us all the days of our life. Even as we partake of these emblems this today, we pray, Lord, that there comes a spiritual reality and vitality coming into our lives. That through us, we may reach people for you by the love of Christ, by the spoken blessings to others, by the life that we live in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's partake of the cup. In the cup. We cannot deny, Lord, your unfailing love over us. <laughs> week after week, month after month, and year after year. But now your love has sustained us, nurtured us. Father, we stand before you right now at the threshold of what you have planned for our inheritance. We gladly step into it, Lord. For it is our tomorrow. Let our tomorrow be today now. And we may be able to enter into the greatness of your destiny for us. And we can express our love for you. Our love, our devotion for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.